Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good afternoon, everyone. It is Tuesday, July the 2nd, 2024. It is currently 2.45 p.m. Central Time, and I am coming to you live from the Theology Central studio located right here in Abilene, Texas. Now, it was January the 14th, January the 14th, 1984, January the 14th, 1984, right? Do you you remember that? Some of you weren't alive. That's okay. January the 14th, 1984, I was sitting in my bedroom, Buffalo Gap, Texas. I was sitting in front of all of my stereo equipment. And I was listening to the Top 40 Pop radio station. Now, 1984, you kind of know who was the king of pop at that time, right? Michael Jackson was ruling the world in 1984, okay? So Michael Jackson, Michael Jackson, 1984, okay, all right. And so all of a sudden the DJ said, hey, we have a new song and Michael Jackson is on it. And I was like, whoa, a new song. Wait, when did, when did Michael put out a new song? They're like, now the song is not by Michael Jackson, but Michael Jackson is on the track. And I'm like, okay. Now, there was no one in the room to talk to, but I basically was like, okay, no one interrupt. This is going to be life changing. January the 14th, 1984. I cannot tell you the exact time, but I'll never forget when the song started because the lyrics went something like this. Who's watching? Tell me who's watching. Who's watching me? I'm just an average man with the average life. I work from nine to five. Hey, I won't say the next word. I pay the price. All I want to, all I want is to be left alone in my average home. But why do I always feel like I'm in the twilight zone? I always feel like somebody's watching me and I have no privacy. I always feel, I always feel like somebody's watching me. Tell me, is it just a dream? When I come home at night, I bolt the door real tight. People call me on the phone. I'm trying to avoid, but I can, but can the people on TV see me or am I just being paranoid? When I'm in the shower and I'm afraid to wash my hair because I might open my eyes and find someone standing there. People say I'm crazy, just a little touch, but maybe showers remind me of psycho just too much. That's why... I always feel like somebody's watching me. Oh, come on. I know some of you, you don't remember it. You're, you're way too young. I mean, you should, you, you may not remember it. I mean, you should know it. I mean, you don't have to be born at a time to know. I mean, we know who Beethoven is. We know who Mozart is. We know who the Beatles are. You don't have to be born to know a song because you have access to every song that's ever been made on any streaming service. So you should know it. But okay. But even if you don't, all I cared about now, I, at first I tuned in because Michael Jackson's on. He does the backing, he does the background vocals. So I just, oh, there's Michael. Oh, there's Michael. Oh, there's Michael. Oh, there's Michael. That's all I kind of cared, cared about at first. But then I was like, oh, this, I like this song. I like that. Okay. This is kind of clever. Okay. This is kind of funny. Somebody's watching me. Am I paranoid? Am I just a little touched? Maybe showers remind me of psycho just too much. Okay. I, I remember, I, I'm like, and then the next thing you know, you know, everybody's walking around singing song. And then of course you run to MTV. You want to see the video. You got to see the video. I loved that song. Somebody's watching me. By Rockwell, if you don't know the original artist, Rockwell. Okay, that's who it was by. Of course, everyone just knows Michael Jackson was on the song. But that's the song. Now, why am I talking about January the 14th, 1984, and me listening to a song? You probably don't care about music, or you probably think it's horrible and ungodly. I understand. You don't talk to Christians about music. But I had to use that opening illustration because that's all I can think about. Because just a little while ago, I was listening to a webcast. Now, remember, we're all supposed to be listening and watching the live webcast on the Sermons 2.0 app. That's the challenge, right? That's the challenge for the next two weeks is you're supposed to be watching the live webcast. I know there's plenty of them going on right now that we're supposed to be watching, but that's what you're supposed to be doing, just choosing random ones. So I chose a random one 
And at first it was really, I was maddening. I was just sitting here in my chair, just rocking back and forth because it was just silence. The, the way the camera angle was, it just showed this huge Bible. And it's like, there's, and then someone would kind of walk up there, take a drink of water, walk away. Nothing, nothing, nothing. nothing. Finally, the, the, the service began. And I, you know, all I can say, it was very formal, very formal. Okay. Very, just very, not, not, not a lot of, uh, how can we say? It was very understated, very somber. Some may say very reverent, right? They sang Psalm 46. They did a scripture reading. The scripture was 1 Corinthians chapter 16. They read the entire chapter. Then they prayed, and this is probably no exaggeration. The pastor, his prayer, and I don't think, (laughs) I'm trying to be fair here. It felt like it was 20 minutes long. It was like a 20 minute long prayer. And it felt like a sermon. Like I was thinking as I'm listening to this prayer, should I have my head bowed or should I be taking notes? Because I mean, he talked about election and predestination and effectual calling and regeneration. (laughs) And it just went on and on and on and on. And I think he covered every major, I think he, he covered everything from Genesis to Revelation. It was the longest prayer in there and the history of recorded prayers. Okay. So it's like, okay, good, good. All right. Good. All right. Then finally the, the sermon began on first Corinthians 16 and it became, it became obvious really soon, really quick that even though he read the whole chapter, he wasn't going to actually expound or exegete the chapter. He was going to focus primarily on one verse. And I'm like, okay, okay. And, and in fact, as soon as, as soon as any time I hear a sermon and the pastor says, turn to first Corinthians 16, it's almost inevitably they're either going to talk about money giving, right? Because that's the first part of first Corinthians 16. If you look at it, first Corinthians 16, verse one, now concerning the collection for the saints, I have given a uh, order to the churches of Galatia. Even so do ye. Again, it tells you how the collection of the saints, how the giving should be done in the church. All right. So it's either going to be that, and if it's not that, it's inevitable. It's going to be 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13, where we read this, this, this word, watch. Somebody's watching me. Okay, watch. Now, at that point, I wasn't really thinking about the Rockwell song, all right? but he, he read, watch ye stand fast in the faith, quit you, uh, quit, quit you like men, be strong, let all your things be done with charity. But he, 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 he focused primarily on verse 13. Watch ye stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men. Be strong. All right. Or as it, as it reads in this translation, watch stand fast in the faith. Be brave. Be strong. Let all that you do be done with love. I think he was reading from the King James. I think he was reading from the King James. But so there's there's two translations. So I, I didn't really give much thought about it. I, I, the watch there didn't really jump out at me at that point. So then he kind of basically, before he really started expounding or exegeting 1 Corinthians 16, 13, he went back through kind of an overview of first Corinthians, which is, I thought was really good, right? He went through kind of the, the overview, but then he got to first Corinthians 16, 16, 13. And in some ways it felt like he kind of forgot everything that came before because immediately he said, watch ye. Now here's the question in first Corinthians 16, 13. This is the, 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 if we were in a hermeneutics class, this is what I would do. I would walk in and go, all right, class today is first Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13 day. I hope you do well. A good portion of your semester grade is going to be determined on how well you can interpret this verse. But we're not going to even have you work on the entire verse. We're going to just have you work on the first two words. Watch ye. That's all we're going to focus on. Watch ye. And here's the question. What should you be watching for? What should you be watching so immediately when I started thinking this out, as I'm listening, writing out my own hypotheses, I'm like, you know, who should I be watching? Somebody's, oh, wait, okay. Well, oh, the Rockwell song, January the 14th, 1984. Then immediately, because I, I relate everything to music, okay? So then I started thinking about the song. But really, I want you to think about, and that's the question, that's the, that's the interpretive hermeneutic class question of the day, all right? Whoever gets this right, you'll be Val Victorian. Whoever gets this wrong, you get kicked out of seminary, okay? Are you ready? You've got to get this right. Who? are you to be watching for? 
Who are you to be watching for in 1 Corinthians 16, 13? Now, in the webcast, he turned it into watch for Satan. Satan is out to get you. Watch for his schemes. Watch for, watch for his devices. And I think most, I think if you preach that in most churches, they'd be like, amen. We need to be watching for Satan. But I'm going to challenge that. And I'm going to argue that in the context of 1 Corinthians 16, 13, that's not telling you to watch for Satan. So you can either go, now what some people may say, watch for Satan. You may agree that of the things I'm about to tell us we need to watch for, or you may say watch for both. But I just think in the context here, I don't know if Satan is really the focus here, right? And and, and so I just started doing a little bit of research. The first thing I wanted to know is, well, is Satan mentioned in 1 Corinthians? Well, I know the only place, and I could be wrong, I believe he's mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5. But when 1 Corinthians 5, 5 Paul is not telling them to watch out for Satan or Satan is out to get you. No, actually, look what they're telling them to do in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. This is pretty fascinating. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we know we have some sexual sin going on in the church, right? It is re- actually, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 in the New King James. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and such sexually immorality as not even named among the Gentiles. Hey, there's, you've got some sexual sin going on in your church. Then even the Gentiles don't even talk about this. You guys are taking it to a whole new level. Now, please note, this is happening inside the church, inside the church inside the church. I know we always like to think the church is the bastion of family values and the church is is the fortress of sexual morality. The, the church is just as messed up as everything else because we are saved by an imputed righteousness, meaning we are declared to be righteous, but in practice, we're still sinners. Okay, well, we can get a whole discussion there, but there's some something going on. So what is going on in the church? That a man has his father's wife. So there's a son having relations with his father's wife. Okay, something's going on here. This is an issue, all right? So, and you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who have done this deed might be taken away from among you. The people in the church are kind of like, well, you know, so what? We're not going to do anything about it. We're just going to, we're just not going to do anything about it. So what does Paul tell them to do? Here we go. For indeed, as absent, this is verse three, for indeed as absent in the body, but present in the spirit, have I already judged as though I were present it, uh, him who has done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. This is church discipline. Hey, this is going on. You guys don't seem to care. So I'm going to tell you what to do. When you come together, you turn this person over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. This is not, be on the lookout for Satan. Satan is out to get you. This is not even, this is not even, Satan is the cause of this. There's no blame of Satan. There is no warning about Satan. This is like, no, give the man to Satan so Satan can destroy his flesh, right? I mean, that's why church discipline is one of the most frightening, horrifying scary concepts. I like it should scare people to it's why it should it, it should be like the last 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 beg plead plead no I've got to avoid church discipline at all costs because you're basically taking a person saying here you go Satan kill them destroy their flesh now you're doing so in order that the person then will be broken and repent of the particular sin. But it's a it's a frightening concept. But so right there, I know in 1 Corinthians, Satan is not seen as the cause or the concern or the the enemy, really. It's not really focused on that much. So in light of 1 Corinthians 16, 13, who should we be watching for? Should we be watching Satan? I don't think 1 Corinthians 16 tells me, watch for Satan. So let's, let's back up and Let's do a little work here. So I, I, while, while I was listening to this webcast, I started doing some work, right? I think I, and now you can correct me if you think I have anything wrong here, but I believe I'm pretty accurate. And the church, and the only reason I feel somewhat, 
I feel somewhat confident about my approach here is I did spend four years going verse by verse through the book of 1 Corinthians, and and, and I've taught every single verse of the book. I spent four years in in the book of 1 Corinthians. So I think I'm I'm pretty good taking who knows how many seminary and Bible college classes on it. So I feel like I have a, a basic grasp of it. I could be wrong on my approach to 1 Corinthians 16, 13, but I think I feel pretty confident with what I'm about to say. The church in Corinth, now remember, this is the way I always describe it. When, when I was preaching the, uh, the first Corinthians for four years, every single service, Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday, in some cases we were using four services a week to teach first Corinthians. I stated it every single time. First Corinthians is a letter written to a church that was located in the city. The city was influencing the church more than the church was influencing the city. I said that over and over and over. people got, I mean, it just ever, I mean, I could walk into my church now and just start saying that and everyone's going to finish it. They may not know anything else, but they know that. All right. And in that church, that church faced various issues and challenges that were causing division, immorality, and confusion among the believers. These problems included division based on loyalty to different leaders, sexual immorality within the church, lawsuits among believers, misuse of spiritual gifts, improper conduct during the Lord's Supper, and some serious questions about marriage. And and well, we can get into a whole discussion about that. Food, sacrifice to idols, and other, and questions and doubts about the resurrection. All of that was going on. In fact, I, I put an outline. I, we, I could break this down for you, but I can just go through quickly, through probably about maybe six major issues. There were divisions and factions in the, fir, uh, the church. First Corinthians chapter 1, 10 through 17, something along those lines. Divisions and factions in the church. There was clearly sexual immorality, as we've seen in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, when we can go say verses 1 I don't know, verse 11, 12, something along those lines. There were lawsuits among believers. They were suing one another. I think that's like 1 Corinthians 6, 1 to 10, 1 to 9, 1 to 11, somewhere along those lines. Then there was clearly some some serious issues about spiritual gifts. And I think that kind of covers 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. And I know I put the love chapter there, but I think the love chapter is instrumental in trying to fix their misuse of spiritual gifts because you should be caring about other people more than flaunting your own gift. Okay, we could get into a whole discussion there. Improper conduct during the Lord's Supper Okay, that's, I think, it's at 1 Corinthians 11. I mean, they had some serious, people were dying and getting sick with the, how they were approaching the Lord's table. It's one of those things that I don't think anyone takes, if I look at the way most churches serve the Lord's Supper, I'm like, I don't think anybody here takes this seriously. Because if you really believe people were getting sick and dying, I would think there would be some serious cause of concern for how you approach the Lord's table. I think there would be like, you would fence the table. You would not have close communion or open communion. You would have closed communion. Nobody, unless they were a member of the church, should even be near the table. Okay. I mean, we could have a long discussion there, right? I mean, if people are going to die, you don't hand it out. Hey, we're going to hand out the Lord's Supper. I mean, you may die, but hey, thanks for visiting our church. Now drink the Lord's, uh, here's the, the cup and the bread. If you die, don't blame us. I mean, like, I mean, okay, no. All right. Um, then there's questions about marriage, food sacrifice to idols, and the resurrection. And you have this in chapter 7, 8, and 15 is the resurrection chapter. So you have all of that. Then chapter 16, you have questions about giving. Now, you could argue whether there was a, a problem there. So those are the main problems. Divisions, sexual immorality, lawsuits, misuse of spiritual gifts, improper conduct at the Lord's table, and then all kinds of issues pertaining to marriage, food sacrificed unto idols, and uh, the, uh, questions about the resurrection. And then we could talk about chapter 16 giving. Those were the issues. Those were the issues. Now, now I'm taking this from a, a, a different source. This is, this is not me. In order to understand the exhortation in 1 Corinthians 16, 13, we have to consider the entire epistle. It is helpful to consider the overarching themes and messages conveyed throughout the letter. How can we interpret the exhortation in light of the context of the entire epistle? How can we interpret it? So my thing is, if you're going to say, who are we to be watching for? He went into Satan, Satan, 
Satan. Now, I'm not going to say that's all he focused on, but there, I felt like that it really started turning into that. And I was sitting here going, I just don't get the Satan part. Where is he getting Satan from? How did Satan show up here? I think the issue is what they what he is exhorting them, if I can speak correctly, what he's exhorting them to do. I mean, I can spit it out. Just be patient with me. If he is exhorting them to be watching I think something specific that would be related to everything that's wrong in the church of Corinth. Now, some see, some people say, it's Satan is the fault. Satan is the problem. Satan is the problem. And I, look, Satan, we, we, we talked about Satan last Sunday, okay? We, we talked about him, we'll be in, and I, I went through a lot of the, the issues and subjects, and, and we could get into a big talk about Satan, but I think in 1 Corinthians 16, I don't think you're being told to watch out for Satan. Satan, I don't think, is ever blamed for most of it. Throughout the epistle, Paul addresses various issues within the Corinthian church, such as division, immorality, doctrinal errors. By exhorting the Corinthians to be on guard or to watch, he underscores the importance of spiritual vigilance and the face of those challenges. The Corinthians are called to be alert to, well, I think the issues in the church. Now, I've got a lot more notes here, but let's, I'm going to, I've, I'm, I'm going to say that the hypotheses that the, the exhortation in 1 Corinthians 16, 13 is about Satan. I'm going to say that that exhortation does not stand, I don't think it is supported by the textual evidence of the chapter. In fact, even in the message I was listening to, he had to go to Ephesians and then bring Ephesians over to 1 Corinthians. I No, you stay in the original context first and foremost. If you're going to go do cross-referencing, the cross-reference has to have some link and be related in some way, shape, or form, typically, right? Typically, I think so. So here's what I'm going to say. I'm going to put forth a hypothesis that watch ye, I'll just start with watch ye, is that he is telling them to watch them. Somebody's watching me. Yeah, you. We have to watch ourselves. The church loves to watch the world. And we've got to be, oh, everyone, we need to be on the lookout for the world. Watch what the world is doing. Watch what's going on, on in the culture. we got to fight the culture. we got to be on the lookout. we got to be on guard. to the, You better be on guard, not to the people outside the church. You better be on guard to the person sitting in your pew. You. You the problem. I'm the problem. Somebody better be watching me. And it's me that has to be watching me because I know me better than the person sitting next to me. I know me better than you listening to me because I know what's going on inside of me. Oh, I can put on a good facade, but I know I need to be watching me. The way one source breaks this down. Be on, be on your guard, stand firm and the faith, be courageous, be strong, be on guard, be alert. Paul urges the Corinthians to be watchful and alert, to be aware of potential dangers, temptations, and spiritual attacks. The admonition highlights the importance of vigilance and discernment in the Christian walk. Now, the only problem I have with that source, it completely ignores the context. No, he's saying, hey, in light of, look, he's giving you 16 chapters of a church. He's writing to people. You guys have failed, 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 fail, fail, fail. You, like, if I was grading for the, the, the church at Corinth, I'd be like, guys, look, I'm not even going to bother giving you an F because I'd have to apologize to all the Fs ever given to anybody else. You guys are so, your score is so low, there's no way to score it. You're the biggest, your, your, your church is, your church makes the city of Corinth look godly and they're a pagan city. You make the pagans look more godly than the godly, okay? Like, it would be like, you guys are a mess. You need to be watching you. You've got all of this failure. You've got to stop. You got to worry about you. You've got to watch yourself. Now, I'm going to look up 1 Corinthians 16, 13. I didn't even think about doing this. But remember, I'm reacting to all of this in very real time, very real time. I'm going to go 1 Corinthians 
16, 13. First thing I'm going to do is look at how this is translated in like every English translation. Be on your guard. Be on your guard. Be on guard. Be watchful. Be on the alert. What are you guarding? What are you watching? What are you in the alert for? You're in the alert and watch yourself. The, the church has been a total mess. Guys, you got to watch yourself. You got to see how the, all of these issues I've addressed, whether it's sexual immorality, whether it's people dying at the Lord's table. I mean, maybe you should care a little bit about people dropping dead. Maybe, maybe you need to be watching your own pride and arrogance when it comes to uh, spiritual gifts. Maybe you need to stop suing one another. Like all these things. You need to be watching you. You need to be on guard for you. You need to be on the alert of you. The church constantly, you listen to Christian radio, you listen to Christian podcast. Oh, the world this. Oh, they did this on Netflix. They did this in this show. And we got to be watching this. And we got to be guarding this. And we got to be banning this. And we got to be censoring this. And we got to be on the lookout for this. And we got to be on the lookout for that. Oh, social media is destroying us. This, everything is something else. How about we just look at the problem that we have? We are the problem. I'm the problem. Hello, it's me. I'm the problem. Okay, now I'm quoting Taylor Swift. Okay, you get the idea. We're the issue. We got to be watching us. Now, if I go to the actual Greek here, I'm going to go to the, uh, I'm going to go to the interlinear. Watch ye, as it is in the King James. Watch ye. Um, is this Greek word. Here's watchy. Oh, this one should be fun to say. Here's this Greek word. Strong's G, 1127. Gregareo. Gregareo. Gregareo, okay. Um, it is, it's used 23 times. It's 21 times watch, one time wake, be vigilant one time. Strong's definition, to keep awake. Watch, be vigilant, wake, um, to watch is the outline of biblical usage, to give strict attention to, to be cautious, to take heed, lest through remission uh, and some destructive calamity would, could possibly overtake you. You got to be paying attention. Why do you have to be paying attention? Because we have a sinful nature. Look, what we, I know we always want to worry about everything outside of us. The greatest danger lives inside of you. The greatest threat is inside of you. If it, what, what pastors should do, they should hand out mirrors. There should be a mirror in every pew. There should be a mirror. And then the pastor every Sunday should come up and go, ladies and gentlemen, I have on good authority identified what is the greatest threat to your spiritual life. And everybody be like, what? Pick up the mirror. Look at the mirror. You, not the person sitting next to you, not the men, stop blaming the women. Women, stop blaming the men. Everyone, it's you. Kids, stop blaming your parents. Parents, stop blaming your kids. Stop blaming your circumstances. It's you. We're the issue. Watch ye yourself. Somebody's watching you, and it should be you watching you. You have to be, in a sense, your own best accountability partner. And you know why you can be your own best accountability partner? Because you know when you're playing games. Come on. You know when you're like, oh, I so want to stop doing this, but I'm going to do it soon. Oh, come on. We all know. I don't think this is about saying, I think it's about us. Now, there's the watch. Be alert. Be guard. Be, be, be on guard. Pay attention. You, 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 you. That's what we have to be on the lookout for. Now, it says, watch ye, stand fast. Stand fast. This translation has it. Watch, it says, stand fast. Stand fast. The This translation has, or I'm going to go to the Greek here. Stand fast is this Greek word. Strong's G, 4739, Staco. 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 Now, this is kind of the way. Now, he did a good job in the webcast pointing this out. Now, he, he put it, he focused on Satan, but what I did appreciate is he kind of said that there's a progressive order here, and I do like that. First, you're on the a lookout, you're on the alert, you're on guard, right? You're on guard, you're standing post, right? 
standing post. When, when I was in the United States military, I was put on a team called the Dirty Dozen, right? We were given a test. And guess what our reward was for acing and pa- you had to ace the test. Guess what the reward was for acing the test? You got put on guard duty overnight. Yay! Yay! I'm so glad I passed that. If I would have known what the test was going to give me, I would have flunked the thing 50 times over. But okay, I got pl- So there you are, two in the morning, guarding a door. <laughs> To the dormitory. Everyone else in there is asleep and you're get there guarding a door. Just dum, 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 dum. Oh, it, I mean, not, just, all you're doing is just standing there. There's not, you're just watching the door. And if anyone comes to the door, you have to assure that they have proper uh, identification, a proper authority to enter the room. If they don't, you have to turn them away. No matter who they are, they don't have proper identification. You turn them away. If they yell, scream, threaten you, but you are to stand guard. You are to be alert. Now, if if you, if someone came to the door and saw you and you're in there sleeping, you're in trouble. I'll, I'll never forget. Desert storm. I get sent. Well, I didn't know where I was going. The plane breaks down over New York City. Then we get taken off the plane because of terrorist threat, a terrorist threat. The whole thing's crazy. We end up back on the plane. We don't know where we're going. Next thing you know, they're like, hey, we're about to approach our landing. And I look out the window. I'm like, wait a minute. There's no sand. There's no desert. We're not in, we're nowhere near Iraq. We're nowhere near Kuwait. Where, where are we? And it's like, we land in Germany. I'm like, ooh, this is pretty cool, right? So we end up in Germany at a place called Swabrücken. Now, the, we are there to set up a turnkey facility. That means everything is ready in the building. All we got to go in, turn the key, pull everything out, and we're now ready to go to set up a medical facility so those who are wounded or seriously injured on the front lines can be then airlifted to us, and then we can provide, you know, surger- surgery or whatever else is needed, okay? So we get it all ready. We're good to go. But here's the thing. The hospital was downtown Swabrook, and the military base was, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 miles from where it is. So we had to take city buses. They sent city buses to pick us up and drive us to the hospital, all right? So we were... we we. We have a shift at the hospital, we get on the bus, and we drive back to the military installation, the Air Force Base. The bus pulls up, and the bus driver's just sitting there. It's, I don't know, it's like midnight, one in the morning, I don't even know what time it is, and we're just sitting there, sitting there, sitting there, sitting there, sitting there, sitting there, sitting there. And the bus driver is picking up his radio, and he's calling other people, and he's laughing, and he's saying something in German. And we're like, what is going on? All of a sudden, one of the sergeants look out and we're like, you've got to be kidding me. We're in the middle of a war, heightened, heightened security alerts for all military installations of the possibility of terrorist attacks. And guess what the guards were doing? They were sound asleep. The military installation, anybody could have just driven right on to the military. They were gone. They were out. And now here's the civilian bus driver laughing at the situation. So he get, the sergeant gets out. He walks up to them, walks all the way into the guard shack. They're, they're just completely asleep. And he goes, bang! And they, they jump up and he's like, you're dead and your career is over. Now, I don't know what happened to him, but obviously they, they were in serious, serious trouble because they were asleep at the guard at the gate, they were asleep at their post. They, in a sense, had abandoned their post. Well, we are sometimes asleep to the danger of us. We got to be looking for us. We got to be, in a sense, we need to take a test to see how good we are at watching us. How good are you are watching your, are you on alert? Are you guarding yourself? Well, so in a sense, we have to be on the lookout. So think about we're guarding. So let's take the first part. Watch ye. We're looking. We're watching. Oh, 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 I see the threat. I see the problem. Now, what we're watching is us. And I see the issue inside of me. I see a desire, a feeling, a thinking. I see, I see issues inside of me. So I got to watch. I got to watch. And what do I do after I watch? What do I do after I watch? And I, and I, and I see, what do I do? I do this. Strong's G 4739. Stay co. I stay co. Stay co. Stay co. I, I watch and then I stay co. I stay co. Okay, what does that mean? It means to, uh, it is to be stationary. It is to preserve. It is to stand fast. 
the outline of biblical usage, to stand firm, to persevere, or to preserve, to persist, to keep one standing. I'm to be stationary. I'm to be, I am to stay right there, not move. But what am I standing? Like, so what, what a lot of people think you'll do, oh, this means I'm going to stand against it. Now, look, look, I think it's fascinating the way the text is read or the, the way the text is written. Watch, stand fast in the faith. Stand fast in the faith. I find that fascinating. Now, one source put it this way, if I can go back to my notes, stand firm in the faith. The call to stand firm in the faith emphasizes the need for unwavering commitment to the core tenets of Christianity. Believers are encouraged to hold fast to their beliefs, to remain steadfast in the truth of the gospel, despite challenges or opposition. What I think is, when you are watching and you're looking for yourself, you see your depravity, your weakness, you see your doubt, you see your fear, your confusion, your anxiety, you see all of the dirt, right? Like, you know, you're watching and you know what's in the behind the closet door. You know what's there and you see stuff that makes you think, what is wrong with me? Why am I so depraved? Why am I such a sinner? Why do I want to do this? Why do I desire this? Why do I not care about anybody else? Why do I only care about... So you know what? You've got to stand firm in your faith in Jesus Christ. You're standing firm in the faith of his imputed righteousness. You're standing firm in the faith of his work and his obedience. You watch and you see and you stand firm in the faith of Christ. Everything thinks it's like stand firm against these things. I think it's staying firm in your faith. Now, I do agree. It's standing firm in the basic tenets of Christianity. But most importantly, you're standing firm in your faith. The, we live by faith. The just lives by faith. And what does that mean? I live my life based off my faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ and his imputed righteousness. Because when I'm watching and I'm on guard and I'm on alert, I am going to see the constant issues inside of me. And I may want to throw my hands up in despair and say, that's it. I give up. I'm a complete dumpster fire. I'm trash. I am I'm a loser. I'm pathetic. I am weak. I am depraved. I am disgusting. I am vile. I don't even deserve to breathe. And you know what? There's a probably from a theological standpoint, when you compare yourself to the holiness of God, all of that is true. But I'm going to stand firm in my faith. I'm not going to crumble because of my depravity. I'm going to stand firm in faith, knowing my only hope is not on me trying to be a better person, but it's about me, guess what? Standing firm in my faith. But then what's next? Watch, stand fast in the faith. Be brave. Quiet, quiet you like men, I think is the way the, uh, the King James puts it. Um, be, be courageous. All right. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the, uh, the Greek here. I'm going to go to the Greek here. Okay. Uh, they're wanting a, 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 they want a donation here. I don't want to give you a donation. What I need is to get back to the text. All right. Here we go. All right. So watch ye stand fast in faith. Qu- quit you. Uh, quiet. Quit you like men. I keep saying it the wrong way. I apologize because I've got multiple translations here. Quit you like men is, oh, this is a, a doozy of a Greek word. Strong's G407. Andridzomai. Andridzomai. Uh, Andridzomai. All right. This is used one time. <laughs> all right. Quit you like men. It's used one time. All right. The, it means to, uh, to act manly, quit like men, to, to be a man, be manly, uh, to make a, ma- uh, a, a man of or make brave, to show oneself a man, be brave. I, I think the idea, I like the idea, the way it's translated in the New King James, uh, be brave. Bravery. You need to be brave. You need to be courageous. Now, why? Well, you're, you're looking out and you're like, oh man, oh man, oh man. I'm a sinner. I got this problem. You're, you're watching yourself. And then guess what? You stand firm in your faith. And guess what you need? You need to be brave and courageous in light of your depravity. And, your, and that bravery comes from the fact that you stand in the imputed righteousness of Christ, which gives you the strength to say, you know what? I should probably walk away in embarrassment because I'm a hypocrite, but I'm going to stand firm and I'm going to be courageous because I stand firm in the faith of what Christ did for me. 
um, my notes, I put it this way. Uh, Paul encourages the Corinthians to exhibit courage in the face of adversity and face of your own failure and face of, I think what he's saying to do, be strong, be brave, or be brave here, be brave in the face of your own failure in your own. Look, guess what you, after Paul lays out all of your failures, you know what I would think about doing? I would think about like, you know what? Maybe just call it a day. This church thing, this Christianity thing is really not working out for me because I keep sinning and I keep failing. No, 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 no. Stand firm in your faith and then be be brave to stand there. You know why it's going to be hard to be brave? Because everyone's going to be like, hypocrite, sinner, loser. Never do what you're supposed to do. You fall short continually. You're a loser. You're pathetic. Accusation after accusation. You know what? And sometimes all you can say is, you're absolutely right. I have no business calling myself a Christian. But you know what? I, I'm a Christian not because of what I do, but because of what Christ did. It takes a little bit of bravery to continue to stand there when everything around you, everyone should say, just give it up. You're not even being remotely, you, you're, you're, everyone in the church of Corinth should just kind of walk away and go, you know what, we're, well, let's just close this church down and call it a day because we are losers. No, stand firm in your faith and be brave and, and the face of that failure and the face of your weakness and the face of your shame and the face of your sin, be courageous. It's boldness. It's fearlessness. Because of because you're standing firm in your faith. So watch. What are, you, what are we watching? Who are we watching? We're watching ourselves. We stand fast in the faith. Why do we have to stand fast in the faith? Because I don't know. Watch yourself and report that back to me. You're going you're gonna to see some really di- di- disturbing things. You're going to need to stand fast in your faith. And guess what? You're going to have to be brave because as you're standing fast in your faith, you're going to be confronted with your own failure and your own hypocrisy. And if you, and look, I don't know how old your kids are now. Just wait till they get a little bit older. They'll point out all of your hypocrisy. Or they're probably already telling your, their Sunday school teacher about how messed up you, mom and dad are. All right? All right? Be brave. Next, be strong. Be strong. The King James has it as watch ye stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men. Be strong. The, the idea be brave, now be strong. The command is to be strong underscores the idea of drawing. That you're drawing strength, but I think the idea, where are we standing strong in? I think we're standing strong in the context. Everyone will kind of go other directions, so I'm going to not rely on any other resources here. I think we are being strong in our faith. We're being strong in our 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 position in God. I, look, I'm not going to be strong in my ability to do better. Look, I mean, think about it. From a politi- from a uh, logical standpoint, why would Paul even give them this exhortation? They've demonstrated in 16 chapters they can't do anything right. So now they're going to go ahead and do things right? No, I think what he's saying, hey guys, based off all your weakness and failure, you need to watch yourself and then you need to stand firm in your faith and then be brave in your faith and be strong in your faith. Be strong in the fact that I am in Christ and in Christ, not practically, but positionally. I'm a new creature. The old is gone. Everything is new. I am perfect and holy. Be strong in that. If you're going to be strong in your efforts, you're going to be strong in your attempts to do the right thing. You're going to just realize you're not that strong. You look, as long as you have a sinful nature, whatever strength you pretend to have, it's only it's only a it's only a pretend strength because internally you are a, a, a depraved sinner and it's there whether you can mask it or not. So watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong, and let all that you do be done with love. Everything you do, do it with love. You know why you should be able to do everything you do with love? Because the only reason that you can stand firm in your faith is because not because you love God, but because he first loved you. He sent his son to die for you. And in Christ, he has given you, he has accredited to your account perfect righteousness. So you can stand firm in that. And then you can be brave and you can be strong because of what you are in Christ, not because of what you are in practice. You watch to see how messed up you are. You're strong and you're, you you stand firm in your faith, then you are brave and you're strong. And then we should do everything out of love because of the love we have received. That I think is a better approach to 1 Corinthians 16, 13. 
And I don't think it's about me watching Satan. I think it's about me watching me. I didn't even get to all my notes. In fact, I ignored 90% of my notes. All right? There we go. I don't think I, I, I think the only thing I may have messed up is quit you like men, quiet you, quit you like men, right? Yeah, I think that's the only thing I may have messed up. All right, if I messed that up, I apologize. All right. I think everything else I got halfway decent. Probably messed up some of those Greek words, but they're pretty good. See, you know what? I'm watching myself, and guess what I'm seeing? I'm seeing my mess-ups. I'm seeing my failures. Now, this is in podcasting, but in my normal life, guess what? When I watch myself, I say, oh, I kind of messed up here, and I messed up here, and oh, I had this bad thought, and oh, I had this, and do this, and I had lust, and I had this, and I had greed, and I had this, and I had uh, this, and I had hatred, and I had bitterness, and this, 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 and this. Oh, man, I'm a mess. I'm going to stand firm in my faith. My faith is in the finished work of Jesus Christ, and he's imputed his perfect righteousness to me. Now, in light of that truth, I am going to be brave. I'm going to be brave. And and even though people may accuse me and falsely accuse, or not even falsely accuse me, correctly accuse me and say all kinds of horrible things about me, it may be all true, but I'm going to be brave in the face of that because of what I am in Christ Jesus, and I'm going to be strong in that positional standing, and I'm going to try to then respond and do everything I do out of love. And I think that interpretation stays true to the text. And I don't have to go import something in there. Now, you could argue, well, how does that fit with Satan? Well, you, you, if you want to bring Satan into it, I just think the context there get, tells us exactly what's going on. Personally, I think it does. But you can give me your thoughts. Now, that that is all based off the live webcast that was ending as I went live. That's what I was like. Now, he said some other things there that were just in crazy stuff. Like, you're not showing reverence to God if you're like, I don't know, leading, singing, or preaching, and you put your hand in your pocket. That, and if you get ready to tell people it's time to pray and you're smiling, uh, that, that is somehow not showing reverence to God. That was the most insane thing. The cr- thing I'm going to find the audio clip from is he referred to ordinances as a means of grace, which is insane because that's sacramental language, not the language of a, a church that believes in ordinances versus sacraments. So we're going to definitely do some work on that. All right. There we go. That's my adventure in live webcasting on the 2.0 app today. I don't know how your day is going. Now, go listen to some random live webcasts on the Sermons 2.0 app. That's our, Remember, for the next two weeks, that's your challenge. Just whatever's on the live webcast. It Look, you don't get to choose. Whatever is there, that's what you get. Now, if there's multiple ones, just try to pick a random one. Don't try to look and see, oh, 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 I, I know this church. No, 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 no. Just try to just close your eyes and pick one. Like, uh, Wednesday night, there'll probably be five, six hundred. Just choose a random one, all right? Take good notes. Summarize it. He focused on 1 Corinthians 16, 13, telling us basically to watch for Satan. And I'm saying 1 Corinthians 16, 13 is about us watching us. Somebody's watching me. Probably should be me. Thanks for listening. Everyone have a great day. God bless.